Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. Well, friends, please keep your Bibles open to 1 Samuel and chapter 3. It'll be good for you to do that and to be able to follow along with what we're saying here. But here's the story so far. Back in the time of Judges, God spoke to certain people, but only certain people and only at certain times and only for a certain task. And so as you read through the book of Judges, when we get to the end, we, we read that there was no king and everybody did what was right in their own eyes or everybody did as they saw fit. And if you read through the particularly the last few chapters of, um, of Judges, you can see it's pretty bleak and uh, it was very apparent that the word of God was rare. We come into 1 Samuel, which kind of follows on from Judges. If you're reading through your Bible, you'll see the little book of Ruth in between them. But we go from Judges to Samuel, and we're not surprised to get to chapter 3 and verse 1 to find that the word of God was rare in those days. There were not frequent visions. That follows well uh, what we have there. And so we ask the question then, does God speak? Does God speak? These are rare days we read about in Samuel, and this is normally the case. At a PYV, a Presbyterian Youth Victoria camp a few years ago, we were dealing with the topic of finding God's will for your life. And in doing that, we were confronted by uh, the reality that what we perceive in the Old Testament might not actually be true. You see, as we read the Old Testament, we can kind of get the impression that God spoke to everybody all the time. God spoke to Noah. God spoke to Moses. Uh, God speaks here to Samuel. And then we get to the prophets and, and God speaks. Thus says the Lord, they say. And we can get the impression that when everybody, whenever anybody wasn't sure what was going on, they just asked God and he spoke to them. So it was helpful at that camp that one of our preachers said to the young people, and, and it struck me as well, that if you read carefully, in fact, you don't even need to read too carefully, if you just read the Old Testament and look for it, you'll find that God speaking to people was actually very rare. God didn't speak to everybody all the time. He spoke to certain people at a certain time and often for a certain task. It was quite rare. And that's the case here. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. We shouldn't be surprised. And if you come into verse 2, we recognize too that the, the light is dimming. Uh, Eli is losing his sight physically. He's aging and he's losing his sight physically. But as we've seen from previous chapters, he's also losing his sight spiritually. Now there's a reference here, a phrase here, the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And this is a phrase simply referring to the uh, lamp that burned in the tabernacle of God, the tent of God, the temple of the Lord, and was to burn all night. So it shows us the timing that this vision is happening. But there might be a second meaning to it here. We know that it's not yet dawn. The, uh, the light is still burning. Uh, but maybe there's a second meaning here. You see, spiritually, Eli is fading. His sons who are priests are worthless. But then there's little Samuel. And we find that the lamp of God had not yet gone out. This boy is growing brighter. Well, the word of the Lord was rare, but today is a rare day. Because today is the day the Lord speaks and the Lord calls Samuel. Now, have a look at verse 3. And just see where Samuel is when this happens. Where is he? Well, he's in the house of the Lord, where the lamp of God is still burning. Here is a visual reminder that God is here and not sleeping. Many churches, uh, Catholic, Anglican, perhaps other churches too, uh, often have a red candle, a red light, to signify God is here. My wife as a younger girl, was attending a Catholic school and went to a church where that light had gone out and she was heard to say a little louder than she meant to, God's not here. Not sure the nuns were too pleased with that one. 
But there, there's something else here with Samuel. It's not just the lamp of God. There's something else here. Something which becomes very significant in the next few chapters. The Ark of God. Now, if all you know of the word Ark is Noah's Ark, you might have a picture of a boat, even a large boat. But that's not the image here. Rather, think of it as a box. A wooden box, which contains the Ten Commandments on stone. And here is a symbol of God's presence, God's covenant. And that's what sets this house, this tent, apart from all other tents. The ark of God is there. Samuel is in God's presence with a reminder of God's covenant. So it's kind of a place where you would expect to hear God speak. And he does. Samuel. And Samuel runs to Eli. Why? Why did Samuel run to Eli? Why did he not respond to the voice of God speaking to him? Well, in verse 7, we find the answer to that. That Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And so, naturally, he assumes it's Eli's voice that he has heard, and he runs to him. And there's something significant in the fact that he ran to him, uh, a boy of obedience. He assumes that it is Eli. Now, there's a, a comparison here between Samuel and the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. Hophni and Phinehas, we learn, are worthless young men. But for Samuel, he is growing in the presence of the Lord. For Hophni and Phinehas, we read in chapter 2 and verse 12 that they were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. But for Samuel, he does not yet know the Lord. And so here's the great difference. These men knew something about the Lord, but they had no regard for him. They had no love for him. They had no desire to truly know him. Now you probably know people like this. That some will be like Pharaoh and will have no interest at all in hearing about this God that they... Who's this bloke? But others will be more like Hophni and Phinehas, growing up in a community of faith, seeing and experiencing the benefits that come from that, but having no interest in the God that that community worships. Samuel is a boy growing in the presence of this worshipping community, and he is learning the form of worship, even if he does not yet know the heart of worship. He doesn't yet know the God who is being worshipped. And again, we probably know people like that because... Many of us have been people like that. We've grown up in a community of faith. We're enjoying the benefits, the people who are there. And then a day came when it made sense. And we could say, I truly believe this for myself. Not everybody can point to a particular day or a time when that has happened for them. But we should all be able to honestly say, I know God. And not just say, well, I come here because the people are nice. Samuel is a boy growing in the presence of this worshipping community. Flawed as it is. And he does not yet know the Lord personally. But this is all about to change. Because God speaks. And God speaks to one and he speaks to Samuel. Samuel, Samuel. Samuel runs to Eli. Eli sends him back to bed. Listen. And again, the voice calls, Samuel. And off he goes to Eli. And then finally, Eli gets something right. Because Eli perceives what's going on. You see it in verse 8. Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. There was still some spiritual light in there for Eli. He had enough now to recognize that maybe God is calling him. Earlier, we read that the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And I said that related specifically to the light that was burning in the tabernacle. I believe that's right. But perhaps we could also apply it here to Eli. That the light of God in him had not yet gone out. And he was able to perceive that Samuel was indeed hearing a voice. Now, Samuel needed to know what to do. And so Eli instructs him what to do. Go and lie down. And if he calls to you, 
Say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. In my first sermon on this series, I mentioned a couple of key verses, key phrases from the book of Samuel that we should have in our mind, and this was one of them. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Some of you will remember this song. Master, speak, thy servant heareth, waiting for thy gracious word, longing for thy voice that cheereth. Master, let it now be heard. I am listening, Lord, for thee. What hast thou to say to me? A great song, a song of prayer and song that's so fitting for this passage of scripture. But as I was remembering this song and reading about it this week, I read this comment from a lady in New Zealand. She said, as I started my devotions this morning, this hymn came to mind. It reminded me of my pastor 55 years ago who would kneel behind the lectern while we sang this. How he longed for the master to speak through him. I am still listening. Well, friends, I think this should be our prayer when we open our Bible. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel goes back to bed. He lies down. We don't know how long there was between him, uh, between each call, between each hearing of the voice. I don't know how much longer he lay there in the darkness with that lamp glowing and, and waiting for something to happen. But happen it does. The Lord stood there, whatever that means, and cries out, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel says, speak, your servant hears. Look at his humility. He's taken what Eli has taught him and he has grasped it for himself here. He is a servant waiting to hear from the master. He is a student waiting to hear from the teacher. Speak, your servant is listening. Well, is this humility reflected in us? Here is a lesson for all of us as we open our Bibles, whether we're reading a single verse or a whole chapter, whether we're doing our daily devotion or whether we are preparing a sermon. We must recognize our place, that we are at best servants. And even the teachers are servants. When Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, Paul was a a bloke, an apostle of Jesus Christ, became an apostle. And uh, one of the great letter writers, one of the great evangelists, right at the beginning of the Christian church. And one church was in Corinth and that was having some issues there. So Paul wrote to them to chastise them for their division that pride had caused there. And he reminded them of his own status. People had divided themselves in this church into followers of Paul and to followers of Apollos, two men who were faithful teachers of the gospel. So Paul writes and says, what after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants. That's all we are. We're just servants. You're dividing yourself over a pair of servants. That's all we are. Let this humility be reflected in us. Let us approach this wonderful gift of God, the scriptures, with humility. Be a servant to this word. Well, now we come to what the Lord has said to Samuel. And if I was a teenager, I kind of think that's how old he was, and I had a message to give the bloke who was teaching me and feeding me, I think I would want to provide a better message than this one because it's not a nice message. But prophets don't get that choice. The task of a prophet is to hear the word and to pass it on unedited. And that word for Eli, Eli, you and your family are in trouble. Eli has got it so wrong. Eli, you've been warned. Eli himself had foreseen a disastrous judgment. We'll see that in chapter 2 and verse 25. A prophet had already pronounced the decline of his family. We see that in chapter 2 and verse 31. 
And now the Lord himself pronounces the inescapable doom of Eli's house. Yes, the words of the man of God are now affirmed. And we are reminded that God keeps his promises. Now, this is something we like to think of in a positive way. So when God says, those who honour me, I will honour and I will never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, our hearts are warmed. We find hope in these promises. But if God is a God who keeps his promises and who does what he says he will do, we need to remember that this also means we should believe it when God says those who despise me will be disdained and the Lord judges his people. This family... Eli's family, this priestly family, have been witnessing to God's care for his people. They have known and have taught the law and the history of this nation, a history that is dependent on the actions of God and a law that provides for the priests. The judgment they have brought upon themselves is being pointed out and is coming soon. When you hear the word of the Lord, listen and respond. They didn't. And now there is no atonement. Here again that quote from Joyce Baldwin. Uh, Eli himself had foreseen a disastrous judgment. A prophet had already pronounced the decline of his family. And now the Lord himself pronounces the inescapable doom of Eli's house. There is no atonement. Is that fair? Is it right that God would pass that judgment on someone while they're still alive? Isn't there time for them? Well, Alastair Begg helpfully puts it like this. That Eli's sons had rejected the sacrifice of God, and in doing so, they had rejected the very basis of forgiveness. So having rejected the basis of forgiveness, there is therefore now no basis for forgiveness, save the basis for forgiveness that has been rejected. Does this worry you? Do you worry that it means you can commit such a sin to be beyond salvation? Well, please don't misunderstand it in that way. Here's what Tim Chester says, and I think this is tremendously helpful. It's not that there are sins which are beyond the scope of the cross. There are no sins which are too big for the grace of God in the blood of Christ to cover. The point is this. If you despise the cross of Christ, then you reject the only means of salvation. If you kick Christ's sacrifice, you have nowhere left to turn. It's a confronting warning. So let this warning guide you not to serve the Lord with, with terror, but rather with a holy fear, knowing that you are safe in him and not safe apart from him. Well, it's a rare day. The Lord speaks to Samuel. The Lord speaks to this one. And now the Lord speaks through this one. Because he has a message to share to Eli. Now, Samuel is reluctant to share that message. And who would blame him for that? But it's the task of the prophet to pass on the word unedited and to make the comfortable uncomfortable. This is my task as a preacher of the gospel to the congregation and to this community. I will tell you that there is always hope. I will tell you that Jesus is good news for you and for our community. And I will tell you that to reject Jesus is to reject everything. That's not my joy or delight to make people uncomfortable. That's not what I've set out to do, but I would much prefer to make you uncomfortable and point you to the hope that is in Jesus rather than to pat you on the back and cheer you on as you head down the highway to hell. Samuel might have a similar feeling and Eli is going to help him because Eli is determined to know. Tell me what the Lord has said. Now, he passes on that message. And Eli's response to that impending dis distraction is, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. Now, either he is faithful 
or he is just resigned to what's going to come. I want to remind you of this phrase of mine. When you hear the word of the Lord, listen and respond. And in some way, he has responded. He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. And there might be a measure of faith and integrity there. But I confess I find it difficult. I still wonder why there wasn't any crying out to God for forgiveness. Why he didn't repent and believe. Either way, his end was nigh and we're not too far from seeing it. And while Eli's light was fading, another light was growing stronger. Samuel. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. At the end of of chapter 3. And so here is the word of God to the people. The Lord was with him as he grew up. This is the final of six statements like this in chapters 2 and 3. And if you have a look at them, uh, you'll see how he's been progressing in his time at Shiloh. All the people knew him as the prophet Now the people knew where to go to hear the word of the Lord. If they couldn't trust the priests, at least they knew who they could trust. And it seems that the word of the Lord was no longer rare. The Lord appeared again at Shiloh. The Lord continued to speak through and to Samuel. What a difference we've seen in this chapter. In verse 1, the word of the Lord is rare. But at the end of the chapter, all Israel, from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, know that uh, there is a prophet and have recognized the word of the Lord through Samuel. Well, for us, Samuel is the prophet for his generation. And he's gone now. And all we can do is read of him in the Bible. Is there still a way for us to hear this word of the Lord? Yes, I believe there is. And it doesn't mean that you need to sleep in a church next to an altar. Because as Martin Luther reportedly said, let the man who would hear God speak, read Holy Scripture. Do you want to hear the voice of of God? Read Holy Scripture and pray, speak, Lord, your servant hears. Take your Bible and read this word. And here you will read of the final word of God. Jesus Christ. Salvation for a new life, a new purpose, is not found in Samuel, no matter how interesting he might be. It is only found in Jesus. Jesus is good news for you and for our community. I encourage you, I urge you, plead with you to hear and respond to this good news. Let's pray. Now, Father God, thank you that in your grace you have spoken to Samuel. And while you revealed to him for his first message a, a devastating one, we thank you that through you and through him, the people of his time were able to hear the word of the Lord. Father, in our time, I thank you too that we are able to hear the word of the Lord through the reading of your word and through the preaching of your word. Oh Lord, please help us to listen and help us to know your word. Continue to speak to us, Lord, I pray, to the glory of your great name. Amen and amen.